The World Chess Championship 1972 was a match for the World Chess Championship between challenger Bobby Fischer of the United States and defending champion Boris Spassky of the Soviet Union. The match took place in the Laugardalshall Arena in Reykjavik, Iceland, and has been dubbed the match of the century. Fischer became the first American born in the United States to win the world title, and the second American overall Wilhelm Steinitz, the first world champion, became a naturalized American citizen in 1888. Fischer's win also ended, for a short time, 24 years of Soviet domination of the world championship. The first game was played on July 11, 1972. The last game the 21st began on August 31, was adjourned after 40 moves, and Spassky resigned the next day without resuming play. Fischer won the match 12.5 to 8.5, becoming the 11th undisputed world champion. In 2016, former world chess champion Garry Kasparov commented on the global significance of the match saying, I think the reason you look at these matches probably was not so much the chess factor but to the political element, which was inevitable because in the Soviet Union, chess was treated by the Soviet authorities as a very important and useful ideological tool to demonstrate the intellectual superiority of the Soviet communist regime over the decadent West. That's why the Spassky defeat, was treated by people on both sides of the Atlantic as a crushing moment in the midst of the Cold War. <inaudible> <inaudible> Background The match was played during the Cold War, although during a period of increasing detente. The Soviet chess school had long held a monopoly on the game at the highest level. Spassky was the latest in an uninterrupted chain of Soviet world chess champions, stretching back to the 1948 championship. Fischer, an eccentric 29 year old American, was a vocal critic of the Soviet domination of chess, because he believed that Soviet players gained an unfair advantage by agreeing to short draws among themselves in tournaments. In August 1962 Sports Illustrated, and then in October the German magazine Der Spiegel, published Fischer's article, The Russians Have Fixed World Chess, in which he expounded this view. Fischer himself rarely agreed to early draws in unclear positions. The pressure on Spassky was enormous because for the Soviets, chess was part of the political system. While Fischer was often famously critical of his home country, Americans want to plunk in front of a TV and don't want to open a book. He too carried a burden of expectation because of the match's political significance. No American had achieved the world championship since the first champion, Wilhelm Steinitz, became a naturalized American citizen in 1888. The excitement surrounding the match was such that it was called the match of the century, even though the same term had been applied to the USSR versus rest of the world match just two years before. Spassky, the champion, had lost the world championship match to Tigran Petrosian in 1966. In 1968, he won matches against EFIM Geller, Bent Larsen, and Viktor Korchnoi to win the right to challenge Petrosian for the title. This time Spassky triumphed, 12 and a half to 10 and a half. He is often said to have had a universal style, involving an ability to play the most varied types of positions. But Garry Kasparov notes that, from childhood he clearly had a leaning toward sharp, attacking play, and possessed a splendid feel for the initiative. Before the match, Fischer had played five games against Spassky, drawing two and losing three. In the candidates' matches en route to becoming the challenger, Fischer had demolished world class grandmasters Mark Taimanoff and Bent Larsen, each by a perfect score of 6 0, a feat no one else had ever accomplished in any candidates' match. After that, Fischer had split the first five games of his match against Petrosian, then closed out the match by winning the last four games. 
no bare statement conveys the magnitude and impact of these results. Fisher sowed devastation. From the last seven rounds of the interzonal until the first game against Petrosian, Fisher won 20 consecutive games, nearly all of which were against top grandmasters. Fisher also had a much higher ELO rating than Spassky. On the July 1972 FIED rating list, Fisher's 2,785 was a record 125 points ahead of the number two player, Spassky, whose rating was 2,660. Fisher's recent results and record ELO rating made him the pre-match favorite. Other observers, however, noted that Fisher had never won a game against Spassky. Spassky's seconds for the match were Efim Geller, Nikolai Krogius, and Ivo Ney. Fisher's was William Lombardy. His entourage also included lawyer Paul Marshall, who played a significant role in the events surrounding the match, and USCF representative Fred Kramer. The match referee was Lothar Schmidt. For some time, it was doubtful that the match would be played at all. Shortly before the match, Fischer demanded that the players receive, in addition to the agreed upon prize fund of $125,000, five eighths to the winner, three eighths to the loser, and 30% of the proceeds from television and film rights, 30% of the box office receipts. He failed to arrive in Iceland for the opening ceremony on July 1. Fisher's behavior was seemingly full of contradictions, as it had been throughout his career. He finally flew to Iceland and agreed to play after a two-day postponement of the match by FIDE president Max Uwe, a surprise doubling of the prize fund by British investment banker Jim Slater, and much persuasion, including a phone call from Henry Kissinger. Many commentators, particularly from the USSR, have suggested that all this and his continuing demands and unreasonableness was part of Fischer's plan to psych out Spassky. Fischer's supporters say that winning the world championship was the mission of his life, that he simply wanted the setting to be perfect for it when he took the stage, and that his behavior was the same as it had always been. World-class match play i.e., a series of games between the same two opponents often involves one or both players preparing one or two openings very deeply, and playing them repeatedly during the match. Preparation for such a match also involves analysis of lines known to be played by the opponent. Fischer had been famous for his unusually narrow opening repertoire, for example, almost invariably playing 1, e4 as white, and almost always playing the Nydorf variation of the Sicilian defense as black against 1, e4. He surprised Spassky by repeatedly switching openings, and by playing openings that he had never, or only rarely, played before, such as 1, c4 as white, and Alekhine's defense, the PIRC defense, and the Paulson Sicilian as black. Even in openings that Fischer had played before in the match, he continually deviated from the variations he had previously played, almost never repeating the same line. Topic: 1970 Interzonal Tournament. The Interzonal Tournament was held in Palma de Mallorca, Spain, in November and December 1970. The top six players of the Interzonal, shown in bold in the table below, qualified for the Candidates Tournament. Bobby Fischer had not qualified to play in this event, as he had not participated in the 1969 U.S. Championship Zonal. However, Benko and the reserve Lombardy gave up his spot, and FIDE President Max Uwe controversially allowed Fischer to participate instead. A compensation of $1,500 was paid to Benko for this to occur. Portish and Smyslov contested a six-game playoff in Portoros, Yugoslavia, in early 1971 for the reserve position for the candidates' tournament. The match ended 3-3, Portish was declared the winner because of a better tie-break score in the main tournament. Topic: 
1971 candidates matches Petrosian as the loser of the last championship match and Korchnoi as runner-up of the previous candidates final were seeded directly into the candidates match stage, and were joined by the top six from the interzonal. In the Petrosian Hubner quarterfinal in Seville, Hubner withdrew from the match after a loss in the seventh game due to noise complaints. Fischer's 6 0 defeats of both Mark Taimanov and Bent Larsen were unprecedented at this level of chess. His loss in Game 2 versus Tigran Petrosian ended a 20 game winning streak. Fischer's victory earned him the right to challenge reigning champion Spassky for the title. Topic: 1972 World Championship match. Topic: Schedule and results. The match was played as the best of 24 games, with wins counting one point and draws counting one half point, and would end when one of the players scored 12 and a half points. If the match ended in a 12-12 tie, the defending champion Spassky would retain the title. The first time control was 40 moves in two and a half hours. Three games per week were scheduled. Each player was entitled to three postponements for medical reasons during the match. Games were scheduled to start on Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday. If a game was adjourned, it was to be continued the next day. Saturday was a rest day. Fisher insisted that a Staunton chess set from Jacques of London be used. The chessboard had to be remade at Fisher's request. The match was covered throughout the world. Fisher became a worldwide celebrity, described as the Einstein of chess. His hotel received dozens of calls each day from women attracted to him, and Fisher enjoyed reading the numerous letters and telegrams that arrived with compliments or criticisms. Excitement grew as the match was postponed and people questioned whether Fisher would appear. Previously, he had come to the airport and, surrounded by reporters, left. The combination of, Will he play? and American versus Russian created excitement throughout the world. Topic Games Topic Game One Spassky Fisher one to zero Nimzo Indian July eleventh the opening was a placid Nimzo Indian defense, and after 17, bar 4 the game was even Philip. After a series of peace exchanges the position in the diagram was reached after 29, b5. It appeared to be a dead-drawn ending, and no one would have been remotely surprised if the players had agreed to a draw here. Shockingly, Fisher played 29, BXH2, a move that few players would consider in light of the obvious 30, G3, trapping the bishop. In exchange for the lost bishop, black is only able to obtain two pawns see chess piece relative value. Gligoric, Kasparov and other commentators have suggested that Fischer may have miscalculated, having planned 30, h5 31, key 2 h4 32, kf3 h3 33, kilogram 4 bg1, but overlooking that 34, kx h3 bxf2 35, bd2 keeps the bishop trapped. Anatoly Karpov suggested that Spassky was afraid of Fischer and wanted to show that he could draw with the white pieces, while Fischer wanted to disprove that as the game headed for a stale draw. Owing to unusual features in the position, Fischer had good drawing chances despite having only two pawns for the bishop. But the position became hopeless after he made at least one more bad move before the adjournment, which took place after move 40. Fischer could still have drawn the game with the correct 39th or 40th move. He resigned on move 56. 
Topic: Game 2, Fisher forfeits. After his loss Fisher made further demands on the organizers, including that all cameras be removed. When they were not, he refused to appear for Game 2, giving Spassky a default win. His appeal was rejected. Karpov speculates that this forfeited game was actually a masterstroke on Fisher's part, a move designed specifically to upset Spassky's equanimity. With the score now 2 0 in Spassky's favor, many observers believed that the match was over and Fisher would leave Iceland, and, indeed, Fisher looked to board the next plane out, only to be dissuaded by his second, William Lombardy. His decision to stay in the match was attributed by some to another phone call from Kissinger and a deluge of cablegrams. Sportingly, Spassky agreed to play the third game in a small room backstage, out of sight of the spectators. According to Pal Benko and Bert Hochberg, this concession was a psychological mistake by Spassky. Game 3, Spassky Fischer, 0 1, Modern Benoni July 16. This game proved to be the turning point of the match. After 11, QC2 diagram, Fischer demonstrated his understanding of the position with 11. NH5 a seemingly antipositional move allowing White to shatter Black's kingside pawn structure, but Fisher's assessment that his kingside attack created significant counterplay proved correct. Surprised by Fisher's novelty, Spassky did not react in the best way. Instead of 15, BD2, 15, NE2 was possible, Zaitsev, or 15, F3 to prevent Ing4. In particular, Spassky's 18th move, weakening the light squares, was a mistake. The game was adjourned, and Spassky resigned the next day upon seeing that Fischer had sealed the best move, 41. BD3+. Plus. The win was Fischer's first ever win against Spassky. Topic. Game 4, Fischer Spassky, 1 half to 1 half, Sicilian Sozin. July 18. The match resumed with this game on the main hall stage per Spassky's request, but without TV cameras per Fischer's request. Fischer as White played the Sozin attack against Spassky's Sicilian defense. Spassky sacrificed a pawn, and after 17, BXC5 plus had a slight advantage none. Spassky developed a strong kingside attack, but failed to convert it into a win, the game ending in a draw. <laughs> game 5, Spassky Fischer, 0-1 Nimzo Indian July 20. Game 5 was another Nimzo Indian, this time the Hubner variation, 4, NF3 C5 5, E3 NC6 6, BD3 BXC3 plus 7. BXC3 D6. Fischer rebuffed Spassky's attempt to attack, after 15. 0 the game was even. Adorjan. Fischer obtained a blocked position where Spassky was saddled with weak pawns and his bishop pair had no prospects. After 26 moves, Spassky faced the position in the diagram, in which he blundered with 27, QC2, and resigned after Fischer's 27. BXA4 after 28, QXA4, QXE4, Black's dual threats of 29. QXG2 hash and 29 QXE1 hash would decide, alternatively, 28, QD2 or 28, QB1 BXD1 29, QXD1 QXE4 30, QD2 A4 wins. Thus Fisher had drawn level the score was now 2.5 to 2.5, although FIDE rules stipulated that the champion retained the title if after 24 games the match ended in a tie. 
After Game 5, Fisher hinted to Lombardy about a surprise he had in store for Game 6. Topic: <laughs> Game 6, Fisher Spassky, 1-0, QGD Tartakawa. July 23rd. Before the match began, the Soviet team that had been training Spassky debated about whether Fischer might play an opening move different from his usual 1, E4. But when the question was raised as to whether 1, D4 or 1, C4 could be expected of Fischer, Spassky replied, let's not bother with such nonsense, I'll play the Tartakawa defense. What can he achieve? Dot 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 single quote quote. Fisher played 1, C4 instead of 1, E4 for only the third time in a serious game. With 3, D4 the game transposed to the Queen's Gambit, surprising many who had never seen Fisher play the white side of that opening. In fact, he had previously openly condemned it. Spassky played Tartakawa's defense 7, B6, his favorite choice in many tournaments and a line with which he had never lost. After 14, B flat 5. Introduced in Furman Geller, Moscow 1970, Spassky responded with 14. A6. Geller had previously shown Spassky 14. QB7, the move with which Geller later beat Jan Timon at Hilversum 1973, but Spassky apparently forgot about it. After 21, F4 Fischer had the upper hand Hort. After 26, F5, White had a crushing attack. After this game, Spassky joined the audience in applauding Fischer's win. This astounded Fischer, who called his opponent, a true sportsman. Lombardy was ecstatic, Bobby has played a steady, fluent game, and just watched Spassky make horrendous moves. Spassky has not met a player of Bobby's genius and caliber before, who fights for every piece on the board, he doesn't give in and agree to draws like the Russian grandmasters. This is a shock to Spassky. According to C.H. Ode. Alexander. This game was notable for two things. First, Fischer played the Queen's Gambit for the first time in his life in a serious game, second, he played it to perfection, the game indeed casting doubt on Black's whole opening system. The win gave Fischer the lead three and a half to two and a half for the first time in the match. Game 7, Spassky Fischer, 1 half to 1 half, Sicilian Nydorf. July 25. Spassky played 1, E4 for the first time in the match. Fischer defended aggressively with his favorite poisoned pawn variation of the Nydorf Sicilian, and after 17, NC6 had the upper hand, gypsless. He consolidated his extra pawn and reached a winning endgame, but then played carelessly, allowing Spassky to salvage a draw. In the final position, Fischer had two extra pawns but had to execute a draw by perpetual check in order to escape being checkmated by Spassky's two rooks and knight. Topic. Game 8, Fischer Spassky, 1 0, English symmetrical. July 27. Fischer again played 1, c4, the game remained an English opening rather than transposing to another opening as in game 6. After 14, a6, the game was even. Spassky gave up an exchange with 15, b5 for little compensation in the way of a positional advantage. It is unclear whether Spassky's 15th move was a sacrifice or a blunder, but his 19th move was definitely a blunder that lost a pawn and left him with a hopeless position. Fischer won, putting him ahead 5-3. to three. 
Topic Game Nine: Spassky Fischer, one half to one half, QGD Semi Tarash. August 1st. The game was delayed when Spassky took time off for illness. The opening was the semi Tarash defense of the Queen's Gambit declined. Fisher played a theoretical novelty on the ninth move. After 13.0-0 the game was even Palmer, and the game ended in a quiet draw after just 29 moves. Topic. Game 10, Fischer Spassky, 1-0, Rai Lopez Brea. August 3rd. Fischer played the Rai Lopez, an opening on which he was a great expert. After 25, QXA5, 25, dot XB5. 26, RXB5 bar 6 gives Spassky a better chance. Gligoric, Fischer obtained the upper hand by initiating a dangerous attack on Spassky's king with 26, B flat 3. Matanovic, suddenly placing black in a critical situation. Spassky sacrificed the exchange for a pawn, reaching a sharp endgame where his two connected passed pawns gave almost sufficient compensation for Fischer's small material advantage. Spassky had drawing chances, but played inexactly, and Fischer won the game with precise play. <laughs> game 11, Spassky Fischer, 1-0, Sicilian Nydorf. August 6. This game was a dramatic win for Spassky, his first since games 1 and 2. As in game 7, Fischer essayed his favorite poison pawn variation, Spassky surprised him with the startling 14, NB1 given, by many annotators at the time, retreating the knight to its starting position. Although later analysis showed that the move was only sufficient for equality if Black responded correctly, Fischer did not. If 15 n e7 by Black then 16 n1 d2 and the game is unclear, gypsless. After inferior defense by Fischer, Spassky trapped Fischer's queen and handed him his only defeat ever as Black in the poisoned pawn. Topic Game Twelve Fischer Spassky One Half to One Half QGD Orthodox August Eighth A Quiet Queen's Gambit declined. After nineteen B four Fischer had a slight advantage Udovic, and after twenty four A five the game was even Poligovsky. The game ended in an opposite colored bishop's endgame draw after 55 moves. Topic: <laughs> Game 13, Spassky Fischer, 0 to 1, Alekhine's defense. August 10. Fischer avoided the Sicilian defense with which he had lost game 11, opting for Alekhine's defense. After 8 a5, 9, a4, 9, c3, and black is only slightly better, Gligoric, dxe5 10. dxe5 na 6. 11.0-0 nc5, Fischer had the upper hand Bagirov. The game swung one way, then another, and was finally adjourned at move 42 with Fischer having an edge in a sharp position but no clear win. The Soviet team's analysis convinced them that the position was drawn. Fischer stayed up until 8 a.m. analyzing it, the resumption being at 2.30 p.m. He had not found a win either, but managed to win a complicated pawns versus rook endgame after Spassky missed a relatively simple draw with 69. RC3+. Plus. Spassky's seconds were stunned, and Spassky himself refused to leave the board for a long time after the game was over, unable to believe the result. He remarked, It is very strange. How can one lose with the opponent's only rook locked in completely at g8?
Lombardy noted the shock that Spassky was in after he resigned. While Fisher dashed for his car, Spassky remained glued to his seat. A sympathetic Lothar Schmid came over, and the two shifted the pieces about with Boris demonstrating his careless mistakes. The two were left wondering how Bobby could have squeezed a win from a position which a night of competent analysis by a renowned Soviet team had showed to be a guaranteed draw. Former world champion Mikhail Botvinnik said this game made a particularly strong impression on him. He called it, "...the highest creative achievement of Fischer." He resolved a drawish opposite colored bishop's endgame by sacrificing his bishop and trapping his own rook. Then five passed pawns struggled with the white rook. Nothing similar had been seen before in chess. David Bronstein said, Of all the games from the match, the 13th appeals to me most of all. When I play through the game one still cannot grasp the innermost motive behind this or that plan or even individual move. Like an enigma, it still teases my imagination." When Spassky and Fischer shook hands, many in the audience thought they had agreed to a draw, thinking that 75, are F4 draws. But 75 Rx d4 76, Rx d4 key 2 wins, 75, b5 road 176, Kx b3 re1 also wins for black, the next 7 games games 14 through 20 were drawn. Fischer was unable to get the initiative. Spassky chose lines that Fischer was unable to break. With a 3-point lead, Fischer was content to inch towards the title, and Spassky seemed resigned to his fate. The off-the-board antics continued, including a lawsuit against Fisher for damages by Chester Fox, who had filming rights to the match Fisher had objected to what he said were noticeable camera noises, and the Icelandic hosts had reluctantly, they were to share in film revenues along with the two contestants, removed the television cameras, a Fisher demand to remove the first seven rows of spectators eventually, three rows were cleared, and Soviet claims that Fisher was using electronic and chemical devices to control Spassky, resulting in an Icelandic police sweep of the hall. <laughs> Game 14, Fischer Spassky, 1/2-1/2 QGD Harwitz. August 15. The game was postponed at Spassky's request. Fischer was again white in a queen's gambit declined. After 18, b5, 18, nx b6 qx b6 19, b5 and Fischer keeps a slight advantage, Gligoric bx a4. 19, qx a4 nc6. Spassky had the upper hand Karpov. Fischer blundered a pawn on move 21. Spassky blundered it back on move 27, however, and the game settled into a 40-move draw. <laughs> game 15, Spassky Fischer, 1 half to 1 half Sicilian Nydorf. August 17. Fischer returned to the Nydorf Sicilian, but played the main line rather than the poisoned pawn variation with which he had lost game 11. At move 13, Fischer sacrificed a pawn for counterplay, which Spassky accepted. After 19, c3, Spassky had the upper hand gypsless. After 28, Road 7 The game was even, but when Spassky took a second pawn with 29, qxh5, it allowed Fischer a very strong attack. Spassky, on the brink of disaster, found miraculous replies while in time pressure, and Fischer was only able to achieve a draw by threefold repetition after 43 moves. Two years later, Yugoslav Grandmaster Dragoljub Velimirovich improved on Spassky's play with the peace sacrifice 13, BXB5, winning a crushing victory in Velimirovich al Khazar's Nice Olympiad 1974. Black in turn later improved on Fischer's 12. 
point O to zero minus zero with twelve B four Topic Game sixteen Fisher Spassky one half to one half Rai Lopez exchange August 20. Fisher played the exchange variation of the Rai Lopez, a favorite line of his. After 17, RFE8 the game was equal gypsless. Spassky defended well, and after a tactical flurry in the endgame, ended up with the nominal advantage of an extra pawn in a rook ending known to be an easy book draw. Although a draw could have been agreed after move 34, Spassky used his symbolic material advantage for a little psychological torture, prolonging the game until move 60 before agreeing to a draw. <laughs> game 17, Spassky Fischer, one half to one half, PIRC defense. August 22. Fisher played the PIRC defense for the first time in his career. After 18, QC7 the game was unclear Palmer. The game ended in a draw by the threefold repetition rule. Topic: <laughs> Game 18, Fisher Spassky, one half to one half Sicilian Routzer. August 24. The game opened with a Richter Routzer attack. After 19, NE5 the game was equal. Matanovic, Ugranovic. Like game 17, the game ended in a draw by threefold repetition. Topic: <laughs> Game 19, Spassky Fischer, one half to one half. Alakine's defense. August 27. The second Alakine's defense of the match, the game ended in a draw after 40 moves. After 18, BG5, Gligoric commented, A queer situation has arisen with many tactical possibilities for both sides. After 19, BH5, the position was unclear. After 37, a6, ch owed. Alexander wrote, a miracle, after all the excitements, two piece sacrifices by white and the counter sacrifice of a rook by black, the players have reached a completely equal endgame with no chances for either side. <laughs> Game 20, Fischer Spassky, one half to one half Sicilian Routzer. August 29. Another Richter Routzer, after 13. NXD2 the game was equal. Matanovic, Ugranovic. Spassky outplayed Fischer and got a better position. Fischer headed for a drawish endgame, but Spassky twice avoided a draw by threefold repetition. After 54 moves, Fischer made an incorrect claim of threefold repetition, but Spassky agreed to a draw anyway. See threefold repetition hashtag Fisher versus Spassky. Topic Game twenty one Spassky Fisher zero to one Sicilian Timanoff. August thirty first. This game turned out to be the last game. Fisher used a line of the Sicilian that he had never before played as black, and further surprised Spassky with a novelty on move 8. After 14, QXF6 the game was equal Timanoff. Spassky played badly in the endgame and the game was adjourned with a big advantage for Fisher. However, Fisher's 40th move was not the best, he should have played 40, Kilogram four before H five his actual fortieth move had Spassky sealed forty one KH three preventing 
kilogram 4, he would have had drawing chances. However, his 41, BD7, would have allowed Black to win with 41, kilogram 4 followed by pushing his H-pawn. On September 1st, the day scheduled for resumption of the game, arbiter Lothar Schmid informed Fischer and the audience that Spassky had resigned the game by telephone, making Fischer the winner of the match. Uwe expressed disappointment that Spassky had not arrived at the playing hall to congratulate Fischer in person. The final score was 12.5 to 8.5 in favor of Fischer, making him the 11th world champion. Spassky won three games, including the forfeit in Game 2, Fischer won seven games, and there were 11 draws. <laughs> Aftermath Fischer's crushing victory made him an instant celebrity. Upon his return to New York, a Bobby Fischer Day was held. He was offered numerous product endorsement offers worth at least $5 million, all of which he declined. He appeared on the cover of Sports Illustrated with American Olympic swimming champion Mark Spitz. Fisher also made an appearance on a Bob Hope TV special. But the games in this match proved to be his last public competitive games for several decades. Fisher had, prior to the match, felt that the first to 12 one half points format was not fair, since it encouraged whoever was leading to play for draws instead of wins. He himself adopted this strategy in the match. After having taken a comfortable lead, he drew games 14 to 20. With each game, he coasted closer to the title, while Spassky lost a chance to fight back. This style of chess offended Fisher. Instead he demanded the format be changed to that used in the very first World Chess Championship, between Wilhelm Steinitz and Johannes Zuckertort, where the winner was the first player to score 10 wins, with draws not counting. In case of a 9-9 score, the champion would retain title, and the prize fund split equally. A FIDE Congress was held in 1974 during the Nice Olympiad. The delegates voted in favor of Fischer's 10-win proposal, but rejected the 9-9 clause as well as the possibility of an unlimited match. In response, Fischer refused to defend his title. Anatoly Karpov, who had fought his way through the 1975 Candidates Tournament, was declared world champion by forfeit. Seventeen years later, Fischer entered negotiations with sponsors willing to fund a match under his proposed format, settling on a bid from Yugoslav millionaire Jezdemir Vasiljevic. Fischer insisted that since he had not been defeated in a match, he was still the true world champion. He further claimed that all the games in the FIDE sanctioned World Championship matches, involving Karpov and his challengers Korchnoi and Kasparov, had prearranged outcomes. He then challenged Spassky, tied for 96 and second on the FIDE rating list at the time, to a rematch, leading to the 1992 Fischer Spassky match. In popular culture The musical Chess, with lyrics by Tim Rice and music by Bjorn Ulvaeus and Benny Anderson, tells the story of two chess champions, referred to only as the American and the Russian. The musical is loosely based on the 1972 World Championship match between Fischer and Spassky. During the 1972 Fischer Spassky match, the Soviet bard Vladimir Vysotsky wrote an ironic two song cycle, Honor of the Chess Crown. The first song is about a rank and file Soviet workers' preparation for the match with Fischer, the second is about the game. Many expressions from the songs have become catchphrases in Russian culture. The 2011 documentary Bobby Fischer Against the World features extensive archival footage from the match. The 2014 film Porn Sacrifice tells the story of Fischer's attempts to defeat Russian Boris Spassky and become the world champion. 
The film is directed by Edward Zwick and stars Tobey Maguire as Fisher and Lee Schreiber as Spassky. In the sixth episode of season three of Drunk History, comedian Rich Fulcher recounts the 1972 World Championship match between Fisher and Spassky. Games. Drunk History. Season 3. Episode 6. The 6th of October 2015. Comedy Central. Topic. See also. Fisher Spassky 1992 match equals equals notes <laughs>